Why? Because banks are not financial intermediaries. They do not just gather deposits and then do the analysis and lend out that money. This is how textbooks describe it, even in the leading top finance journals in the world, US journals. That's not how banks operate. Banks don't take deposits because at law there is no such thing as a bank deposit. It's simply a loan that we've given to the bank, so we're general creditors. And banks don't lend money, they're in the business of purchasing securities. If you take out a bank loan, the loan contract that you've signed is an IOU, a debt instrument that you've issued. You've issued a security and the bank is going to purchase that. And you'll say, oh, um, that's confusing, but anyway, I don't care, I just want the money. And the bank will say, well, look into your account that you have with us, you'll find it there. If they say, if the bank clerk says, um, we've transferred it there, that would be incorrect because, of course, no money was transferred to your account from either inside the bank or outside the bank. It was newly created and the numbers were entered into your account because, you see, it's not a deposit. It's a record of how much money the bank owes you. And when they purchased your loan contract, um, an accounts payable liability was created, which is now slightly incorrectly recorded in the bank's books as another type of liability called customer deposits. <laughs> A brilliant uh, a bit of analysis, uh, and not a bit of analysis that you hear uh, anywhere else. So this is how banks create money. In other words, the money supply is created out of nothing by the banking system, and we have to be aware of this power of the banking system. Since this truth has, has um, spread more widely, and people realize, wow, banks are actually money creators. The response by a lot of influential decision makers has been, um, um, oh, banks create money? Well, let's stop this. Let's abolish banks and let's make life hard for banks. Let's have more regulations to make life very hard so profitability goes down. Um, let's flatten the yield curve um, and reduce interest rates to zero and negative territory. That means banks can't earn money. And the traditional productive lending for productive purposes is not any more profitable. So you're driving banks out of business. And also let's introduce competition from the bank regulators. Yes. Let's have the bank regulators compete against banks by offering, by offering current accounts to the general public. There's been so many policies in the last 15 years to make life hard for banks that banks have been driven out of business, particularly the small banks. But that's really now the answer, finally, to your question. Because when you look at the highly successful economies that have high growth systems, and, and the key example is really China, because they came you know, they were initially not successful. You find that the answer is in the structure of the banking system. So let's go there. So 1978, China. The previous period was fairly disastrous, cultural revolution, which is essentially lockdown policies, destroying the artificially um, the food supply chain, creating famine, millions of people dying. And so Mao, um, as leader, didn't really have a very good, strong economic result to boast of. But a new leader came to power, Deng Xiaoping, and he was very smart. He analyzed what is necessary for high economic growth. He went to Japan, he looked at Germany, he looked at the US, and he had the right conclusions. Some people say, oh, he opened up and he introduced market reforms. And in a way, that's true, but it's not just general market reforms. Developing countries have market reforms. Yes. And they've tried this you know, for 70 years, and that hasn't been successful. So what is it that made China extremely successful? Of course, it's a combination of things, but one of the key policies was Deng Xiaoping decided to create banks, found banks, set up new banks, thousands of banks, credit unions, small banks, but what was regional that? banks, local banks, investment banks. But what was the mandate? What was their mandate? To create credit for productive purposes. Oh, wow. And you need lots of them. Yeah. And a decentralized system, you see. So the structure of the banking system then is one where you have many, many small banks, in a decentralized fashion. These are essentially your, your agents that on the ground kick the tires of tens of thousands of small firms. That's, that's a hard job, you know. Yeah, you actually have to do real work. You have to analyze the statements. You have to go there and check them out. It's, are a, they it's real? a lot easier being centralized and just lending on an asset price that's going up, right? Because the, you know, all exactly. uh, rising tide lifts all boats. That's right. And of course, there's a reason why it's, it's difficult because it's, it's highly uh, important for the economy if you do this difficult job of actually checking out each small loan to small firms. And so that's what Deng Xiaoping did. 
He created thousands and thousands of small banks across China. And the result was over 40 years, we had double digit economic growth. More people have been lifted out of poverty in China than anywhere in history. This is phenomenal. However, so this is the lesson from China. However, what has been happening in the last 20 years, in fact, last 30 years, but accelerated, of course, since 2008, is the central planners, because they like centralization, have been clamping down on small banks. So they've been dying. 15,000 have disappeared in America over the last three, four decades. The ECB is a new central bank. So the Eurozone essentially started only around the year 2000. So, you know, 21 years. So how many banks on a net basis were newly created in those 21 years? What do you think? I, I think that this number is anemically low. Yes, it was a slight trick question. No. Paying back for last time. Negative, of course. <laughs> it's, it's a negative figure. We've, we've got minus 4,800 banks since the creation of the ECB. In other words, the ECB has killed already almost 5,000 banks in its very short history. Now, have they killed the Goldman Sachs of this world? Forget it. Exactly. I mean, that's where Draghi and others you know, used to work for. Um, of course, it's the small local community banks that are forced to merge with others and get bigger and bigger and ultimately disappear because they become like the big corporate Which banks. Which is where all the rents trickle up. Exactly. Uh, and because enormous pay for executives, uh, real economy starved, no real innovation. And also, as the banks get bigger, and I've done an empirical study with one of my PhD research students, uh, it's published um, actually recently in Journal of International Money and Finance, and that study shows that the big banks do big deals. This is on American data. Uh, it's the small banks that lend to small firms. But also, over time, as banks grow in size because they're forced to merge, they become the same. So as small banks get bigger, they also lend to bigger companies. And that is the problem. And that's also why we actually constantly need to create new banks. And we need to actually slow down this pressure we've put on banks to merge and become bigger, which can be done, you know, the right policies. But since 2008, and since you asked about that, you know, the policies since, but therefore the policy have been quite wrong because they've forced mergers of banks. And that's been a combination of massively increasing regulation on banks. In Europe, in particularly unfairly, because in America, small banks have their own regulator. But in Europe, any small credit union and small local uh, cooperative bank with, say, 20 staff, they have to meet the same reporting and compliance requirements so, as Deutsche Bank with 2,000 people on the job. But it's impossible. Doing that. It's impossible. Exactly. So they're, they're, they're driven out of business. So regulation. But the second one is also monetary policy. Mm. And, and back to QE. Mm. Because the wrong type of QE has been implemented. Uh, they should go back to my original writings about what QE should be doing. Um, it should enhance bank credit creation for GDP transactions and for productive purposes. But actually, um, they've mainly introduced bank credit creation and central bank credit creation for asset purchases, driving up asset prices. But by doing that, by buying, say, government bonds, you're actually pushing down uh, long-term interest, interest rates. rates. And that's bad for the banks for the, that are lending to the real economy, doing the real lending by evaluating loan projects and so on, because that means the long-term interest rate is being pushed down. So the margin they can earn on their real economy lending to SMEs it's going goes down, down and down, down and down, down, down to zero. Yeah. And so that's another factor how they're being driven out of business. So the, the, the screws have been tightened so much on small banks, they've been disappearing. And that's a trend that urgently needs to be stopped. Um, fortunately, at the Bank of England, it's being recognized that it's a good thing to create new banks. So they have been encouraging the creation of new banks. It's unusual. And that's, that's great. That's the right tendency. We need to set up new banks. Of course, they also need to be the, new, the, the right type. We've had lots of so-called challenger banks that are there simply for shareholders that want to maximize profits. Now, but what's going to happen when these, these type of challenger banks, which are essentially big banks but small, yeah. uh, when they get successful? Well, since the shareholders are in it for the money, as soon as you get the right offer, they're going to sell, and then sell you, off to the next big bank. Which and is then you how, get more consolidation. This is how the banks have disappeared. Because in, in the UK, there used to be thousands of small banks until the First World War. But before the First World War, there's this huge consolidation drive where the big banks swallowed up the thousands of small banks. 
you know, hundreds of provincial uh, county and country banks everywhere. That's when economic growth was much higher in Britain as well, you see, because that's what you need, a diversified, decentralized banking system with many, many small banks on the ground lending to small firms. That creates jobs, prosperity, and also it helps small firms be very competitive. You know, actually, it's an interesting topic. The government has been worried for the last uh, three years about why is productivity Product so low. Right, exactly. Well, I can give you the answer. Go. <laughs> um, let's look at a country that's highly successful in productivity. Germany. Germany, yeah. And of course, one key measure is your exports. I mean, German exports have been almost as large as Chinese exports uh, for many years, and until 2009, larger than Chinese exports, when clearly Germany is much, much smaller than China. Yes, yes. But what's driving that? Um, now, what's driving that is the productivity, because to be successful in exports, you have to be highly productive and, and efficient. And what is driving that? Well, what's, what many people don't realize is that many of the exporters, successful exporters in Germany, are small firms, family-owned firms, small businesses. And in fact, there's a definition, it's called uh, hidden champions. This is when a small firm, because it's small, people don't know the, the name, it's not famous, you know, it's a small firm. But it is a global market leader, having number one, two or three, it's a champion, gold, silver, bronze, market share in the world. So they're defined as hidden champions. Now, if you draw up a chart of the number of hidden champions that every country has, where these SMEs are global market share leaders. Germany stands out like, I mean, there's, there's just almost no competition. Right. Germany has 1,500. And then there's and the then also the, the Number two is, as you'd expect, is the US, yeah. but it's like 300. Right. It's a completely different category. And then most countries have maybe 30, 40, 50. Why is that? It's because the small firms in Germany, they can implement the latest technologies. You know, it's, in, in Britain, we always think that, well, we need to develop new technologies. But actually, Britain is very good at developing new technologies yes, yes, and yes. having inventions. That, that's not where the problem is. It's about applying them. Applying them, but in a practical sense yes. for firms that actually turn it into immediately saleable, successful products. Now, for that, what do you need? You need your small firms to get funding. It's just a money question because it's expensive to upgrade your technology. But the German small firms can do it because they have small banks locally that only lend to them. And the bank manager knows their history and they know, oh, they've got this new technology now. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah, that looks really good. Well, and, and we better give them a loan to implement that technology. Them. They'll be fine for the next six, seven years. And those banks will often put a, a, a bank member on the board to ensure that that loan doesn't there's, go bad. There's many ways to, to, you know, to, to get the incentive structure right. And so that explains the enormous German success and high productivity yes. in the economy because you have a decentralized bank system consisting mostly of small banks that lend to small firms for productive purposes. You get high growth, you get good exports, high productivity. That's really what you want. Now, this can be done in any country. You just need to create these small banks, yes. which is, of course, what I'm, I've been working on. We've got the Hampshire Community Bank coming online now. We're about to submit our bank authorization huge documentation. For a license. For a license uh, to the Bank of England and PRA uh, FCA. We've got uh, a, a top-notch team. Uh, of experienced bankers in, in, um, in their various respective specializations on the bank. All power to you. What you've done uh, in this episode is you've taken us uh, from the